All right, well, let's get started. Should we go around the room, Rebecca? Does that sound good? Sure. So, I'm Matt Hepper, program manager at DARPA, and uh, I get to talk today. So, But we're going to make it interactive and show and tell, so go ahead. I love it. And I'm, I'm Rebecca Katz, and I direct the Center for Global Health Science and Security. And really, what I should have done is start by introducing Matt, but I'm mm. gonna, we all know him, and we're small. I think we so do. Exactly. Here we go. So I'm Matt Lim. I'm with the Navy, obviously. I am, at least as for the foreseeable future, I'm the deputy head of uh, the research and development policy shop within the Navy's Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, which is the equivalent of the Office of the Surgeon General in the Army. Um, I'm Iman Malalga. I'm an epidemiologist at RTI International with the DC and Rockville Office. Oh, great. Um, okay. Hi, all. Matt Boyce, research associate at the Center for Global Science and Security. There's a lot of maps here today. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not Matt. Um, Aaron Sorrell, uh, with the Center for Global Health Science and Security. Okay. Tim Kilbride, DARPA Public Affairs for BTO, Georgetown Steve Grad. Aww. Georgetown. So I, I teach in, that's what I teach in. Oh, I love it. So, yay. Yay, Steve. Yeah. In fact, I did 305 yesterday. <laughs> so, it's, we need to sing Tim's praises. I mean, I think. Um, I, I will say this, in my entire Department of Defense career, I mean, the, the best public affairs group is them. Um, DARPA does a really good idea, does a really good job projecting, like we actually, it's not like hold it in and don't tell anybody and get all this, you know, permission slips and everything else to actually project our message. Like we're very forward leaning and so they clear stuff quickly, they encourage us to get out there to share the technology and it's really... Um, especially in our biological technologies office, to avoid misperception, one of the things we say is our work is unclassified, we are completely transparent, we encourage the researchers that we fund to publish in peer-reviewed journals, um, and I think that posture is, has been really, I think it's been really effective, I think it's been helpful, it's been good for the, it's been good for the DARPA image, but more broadly even for the Department of Defense image, to show that, hey, we really care about emerging infectious diseases and we're doing a lot of investments, and we're, we're going to let you know what we're doing. I don't know if you want to comment anymore, but... Um. Yeah, I mean, we're, it's a challenge for the office. People assume DARP is all about weapon development, but when we're developing a weapon, we say we're developing a weapon. Um, everything else, you have to take it at face value. We have to convince people about that. So, kind of a challenge, but it's fine. One of the things that Rebecca works on is the Biological Weapons Convention. <laughs> and so uh, part-time over at the State Department, so she sort of understands that not only do we, you know, we have to be careful, uh, of course, you know, we, we don't do these, the, those types of things, but also that there's a formal treaty that says we can't, and so there would be, it would be bad. So we do our stuff for good, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, well, great. So uh, I got about 15 slides. Uh, we're not going to do, um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, let me frame it just in a couple minutes in terms of broadly sort of the DARPA mission. Let me tell you a little bit about DARPA. I'm going to give you some example programs, but I'd rather do kind of show and tell and pass around the stuff because <laughs> we're, we're all about technology. And the, um, that's kind of one of the opportunities at being at DARPA is that because it's a technology organization, um, it, it gives us, you know, we're, we're not, we can't solve all the problems of responding to a pandemic. Um, but what we can do is we can, we can really focus on the technology problem and figure out how that complements everything else that needs to be done. Um, but we're, we're particularly good at the tech part of it. And so then the building is and the, you know, so we can, me being there allows us to leverage all the great kind of advances in technology and the, and the methodology for us to leverage technology for our pandemic preparedness mission. So, um, let me start with this. Uh, DARPA celebrated our 60-year anniversary. Um, uh, we had a we had a big thing down at National Harbor. Tim had to work very hard, <laughs> among others, to, um, uh, to 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 put this together. But the the point is is that DARPA was created after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1958. And President Eisenhower at the time said, "Never again will we as a nation be so surprised technologically." And so, therefore, to maintain that technical edge for national security he created what was known at the time as ARPA, and then they, they added the D later. Um, and that's our mission, to prevent technological surprise. Uh, well, how do we do that? Breakthrough investments for national security. And there's something to be said about clarity of mission. Everybody in the building knows that. We put, you know, I mean, I, I say it probably 14 times a day. 
Um, I, I tell the story that I was recruited to DARPA by a guy named Jeff Ling after I was over at um, National Security Council staff, and it was a very deliberate recruitment by Jeff, who was the deputy director of one of the offices at the time, and then by the DARPA director, and they said, we really want to be... DARPA's always done a lot of stuff in the emerging infectious diseases space, but they said, hey, we want to do more. And we want to, especially in terms of the realm of pandemic preparedness, um, this was before the, the West Africa Ebola outbreak, but it was after H1N1, and, and they said, you know, we, we want to make a concerted effort. And why do we do that? Because in the case of preventing technological surprise, the easy argument is the surprise is the pathogen, right? The surprise is most often, you know, Mother Nature. The surprise is that Ebola can take place in an urban area, right? The surprise is that the, the novel coronavirus of SARS or MERS seems to evolve and, and affect us all. So, so it's, a, it's an easy argument to make that uh, we as a nation and the world community aren't prepared and that we need to do more in terms of that type of preparedness. Um, and furthermore, the argument that we make from a DARPA standpoint is that, that we have a unique contribution in the ecosystem, meaning that we do, we do things that don't duplicate or don't, don't, don't duplicate or compete with other investments that the U.S. government, or I would say even the global community. And how do we do that? I think our fairly unique niche is first around the technology. Um, so, but to be let me clarify one other thing. We don't do work. We invest in technology. So um, uh, part of our ethos is active program management. So I feel like this is mine, you know, and I feel certainly uh, uh, that, that personal interest in seeing this succeed. Um, but, uh, but we invest in technologies. The, uh, but our unique contribution is this idea of um, that we invest early and that we are, we are willing to take risks, take chances, and invest from a very, f have, have a lot of flexibility, which is, I think, in contrast to a lot of um, U.S. government biomedical research and infectious diseases investments. What does that mean? What, here's what it means. Uh, we, can, we can fund a given university professor in a lab. We can do a major cost-sharing agreement with a large pharmaceutical company. We can fund in the U.S. We can fund, any, we can fund internationally. We, can, we oftentimes put together large programmatic efforts that where a multidisciplinary team has to come together and solve a really complicated problem over four years. Or we can do, and I'll give you the ultrasound example, we can do a very modest uh, 12, six to 12 month trial investment, and if it doesn't work, we're done. Um, and we can also cut, and we often do that. Like that's the hardest part of my job is things that we've originally invested in that aren't working out for for us to cut their funding or say, you know, we're not we're not going to continue to invest. Um, but it's kind of how a lot of research probably should be done if it's very purposeful and mission driven. And so um, I think you guys can realize that that's in contrast to most of the way that that biomedical research invests in. Um, my final point on DARPA, and then I'm going to show you a couple example programs. One of the things that, that I struggle with, um, and I think our office, we have a whole office now, the Biological Technologies Office, what we struggle with is that um, our, our, we aim to invest early and to de-risk a technology, okay? And so uh, what that means in our space is that if we're investing in a new diagnostic or we're investing in a vaccine platform or something like that, um, how do you... How much, in, how much work do we need to do to de-risk that before we can hand that off to somebody else, right? So DARPA's mission is not the advanced development of biomedical products. DOD has JPO Chem Biodefense, has the Defense Health Agency. Of course, Health and Human Services has BARDA. So we, we have very natural partners in the U.S. government where that is their job, and that's what they do. And they have literally hundreds of full-time personnel that are devoted to that mission. Um, so we shouldn't really be doing that too, right? So the hard part is how, how far do we go in de-risking a technology before we hand it off? And what I'm going to show you today, if you're savvy, is that we're doing a lot of we're going pretty far into that realm of de-risking it. We're not just doing a very simple early investment and then having someone come in early and pick it up. What we found is that we have to pretty we have to put a lot of effort in that transition. Um, the good news, and I'll highlight something very quickly, is that um, particularly our partnership with HHS BARDA and the NIH, but but particularly with HHS BARDA. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say particularly with BARDA and NIH, but with Health and Human Services has been really strong. It's been really strong. I think that's a function of leadership. Um, but we have two examples um, of co-funded 
uh, co-funded multi-million dollar projects with BARDA uh, going now. One for this influenza season um, and one which is a, which is a co-investment with Metamune to work on antibody an antibody technology that I'm going to explain at the end. Um, we had a DARPA meeting yesterday and the DARPA director highlighted that. Um, a week or two before, the DARPA director uh, presented at BARDA Industry Day. And so it, th that's actually a really big deal. <laughs> like, this is not, this, it's, it's not par for the course like DARPA and BARDA have been working together for years and they co-invest and they you know, figure out how to do these collaborative projects. It's how we should work, but it hasn't, really co it hasn't come to fruition today. Um, let me give you one other example with NIH, and then we'll talk about some other specific technologies. During the um, previous uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa, everybody's familiar with uh, that the U.S. government did a very significant Ebola supplemental. At the time, DARPA had uh, contractual relationships with groups like Metamune for the manufacture of antibodies. So during the Ebola supplemental, an agreement was made between the NIH and DARPA uh, DARPA funding the manufacturing of the NIH VRC114 monoclonal antibody. Um, why did DARPA fund that? Because we thought it was a superior product to ZMAP because it was a single antibody, one-time infusion as opposed to five to eight hour infusion every other day for three doses. And, and obviously in an ETU you can see if, if you have equal efficacy how that would be a much easier product um, for field use. Uh, so we invested then, um, uh, which was mostly manufacturing. NIH did the phase one, um, but I think it, as you guys have been following the Eastern DRC outbreak, that product had originally been developed from uh, a, a recovered patient from a previous outbreak, Ebola outbreak in the Congo. And the NIH, to their credit, this is the Vaccine Research Center, had maintained a close relationship with the Congo's INRB. And so that it was a natural partnership that when not the current outbreak but the previous outbreak occurred that the NIH um, uh, reached out to them. And now I think we're at the, the point of uh, many patients have been treated um, as part of that outbreak, um, as part of that investment. And so um, again, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it's not an example of funding something that no one else had done, but it is an example of where we felt that that technology, this idea of antibody treatment for Ebola and a much more simplified approach to antibody treatment for Ebola was needed to be de-risked and that's why we're continuing to be involved there. Go ahead. How's it doing? Um, so, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. <laughs> so I'll be very careful. And I'm careful on two levels. First of all, I think um, the, you know, again, it's, uh, it's, it's tech, you know, it's an NIH product, but it's being administered in close collaboration with INRB and Congo. So first of all, you know, you're respectful of the, the group on the ground that's really taken hold of this and, and, and been a partner in that project. And then second of all, it's the NIH's product. And so, so usually I, uh, I can't comment. But, um, but, I, can, but the, I can say this, the phase one clinical trial uh, was completed at the VRC. That's on, that, that, those res, uh, that, that's on clinicaltrials.gov. There's going to be, I think there's already a publication. I think the publication's been released on that. So um, we, you can certainly look up the safety profile there. Okay. All right, let's see show and tell. Are any questions on that so far? You need to change the slide to Indopacom. Uh, oh, this one? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Recently. Yeah, Tim, we got to get on that. Because, <laughs> right, that's the official name now, right? Indopacom. Yeah. All right, good. Um, so, uh, so let me tell you about a couple, uh, uh, a couple programs, um, examples in my portfolio. So uh, the, the way that we work is that myself as a program manager, we have a small team of uh, for full-time to part-time uh, PhDs who have complementary skill sets and us and we manage um, we're in the neighborhood now of 75 projects um, uh, a decent number of those are small business or if you're familiar with the SBIR programs um, so about 20 in that in that space um, but and then a few of these projects are big teams like it's one project but it's a team with four or five subs and all this other stuff so um, there's a range of complexity in terms of what we manage um, but it's all it's all again the mission simple it's pandemic preparedness and the DARPA director essentially the the colloquial phrase that I will never forget for the rest of my life is that's your job to take pandemics off the table. 
okay? <laughs> so, you know, the previous director, current director, you see him in the hallway, it's like, how are we doing? Are there still, is there still a threat of pandemics? Well, yeah, there is. Okay, well, you're not doing your job. Um, so, yeah. well, well, yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, in the infectious diseases space, I think we all are gonna be gainfully employed, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, so, so the first program I'm gonna tell you about, so we're, we're gonna talk a little bit, if you wanna break the problem, we break the problem down maybe into two fundamental parts. It's this idea of figuring out what's going on, how bad it is, who's getting sick, um, and then doing something about it, interventions. So on the, on the who's getting sick space, um, I just wanna briefly talk about the Prometheus program. So Prometheus was the Titan associated with forethought or prediction. Um, this is a prediction program on the individual level, predicting contagiousness after exposure to an acute respiratory infection. So uh, among a public health audience, uh, I think it's pretty easy to understand that if we had this capability, how useful that would be. In these early scenarios of, I start to get sick, now we need to know who in the room um, is also going to get sick. The difference is, is that it's one thing to predict symptoms and then to predict severity once you have symptoms. That's also a big important challenge. For this though, we've said, well, what about the situation where you may have minimal symptoms but you have tons of virus in your nose? So what we really wanna do is predict, uh, predict the amount of virus in your nose or predict contagiousness. Um, so we've designed a program to do this. Um, we uh, started off really, when, when I explained this program a couple years ago to DARPA leadership, I said, just doing that is going to be really, really hard. Um, and, uh, the, and, and I'll tell you how we did it, but the good news is, is that I think we're starting to de-risk that technology, and I'll explain why. Um, the second phase of this, which is even harder, which I haven't figured out exactly how we're going to do it, but I'll give you some ideas, is that if we are able to predict contagious stuff in an acute respiratory infection, you, you can't wait for that person to seek health care, right? You, you have, we have to figure out the DOD term as a CONOPS of how are we going to be able to test people really as far forward as possible, meaning in the home, right? Or in their barracks or something like that, where we have to figure out if someone, and again, you can imagine one person sick, but you have to then be able to test everybody else and say, you're going to be contagious you are not. Now why do we want to do that? Of course, if we have no other choice, then that gives us a way to separate or isolate people that are going to be contagious. Um, but to be a bit, which is right, the bad word is quarantine, right? Um, but what we hope is that if we have effective interventions that we can also administer, so you intervene before someone even becomes contagious in the first place. And for infections like influenza, we know that the neuraminidase inhibitors, as a good example, is an earlier the better phenomenon. So if, if we can give this before they become contagious, we, if you will, stop the outbreak in its tracks. So, yeah. So, I'm sorry, I don't know if you want to have questions. Or yeah, yeah, no, 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 we gotta talk. No, 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 so, please. So I was just gonna point, this is great, this is very interesting, but I was also thinking, you know, from an operational perspective, since if we're talking about, you know, defending against threats. I mean, the, the, the thing that's implicit in your slide um, is that on both on the top line and the, on the bottom line, is that between exposure and uh, contagious, or between exposure and intervention, there's an intermediate step there, which is contact identification, right? Because you, you won't be able, and on the top, on the top, you, you typically don't know who you're looking for unless you've got public health and epidemiology to find contacts, or right. people are self-reporting to a clinic, right? right? And then the other, on the bottom, it's, it's, you're going to depend very heavily on public health and, and, and contact tracing. So I'm, I'm just sort of yes. saying that the, the, there's, a, there's a latent assumption in here that whatever technologies you develop are very tightly integrated with some kind of robust public health and epidemiology capability. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, again, the, our, uh, there's a lot of hard problems to solve with this. I mean, our, our sort of default pathway is like, well, we'll do the technology and we'll let everybody else figure it out. Um, what we, I guess the, when we think about how uh, the, when we think, when we imagine the world that we want to be, I think the, um, we can imagine a DOD scenario of a barracks or something like that where we have a better idea that you're in a room with four other people, so right. the three other people are probably your most likely exposure. Yeah. Um, the way that we're actually putting that to work is that one of the, the groups that we're funding is Don Milton now at University of Maryland at their School of Public Health. And what they have is they're recruiting cohorts of students. Uh, they, they've done pilots for the last two seasons. We're going to hopefully recruit 
several hundred students this flu season who live in walking distance of School of Public Health. So, tra so when a student gets sick, who are your close contacts, who's your roommate, who lives on your hallway, sampling them frequently and then saying, did they develop influenza or what other viruses are in their nose? So it's those types of contained environments is how we're kind of putting this to the test. Because it's really, I mean, if you think about it, we need to, to even discover this, we have to get samples from patients who have known, who are known exposure, but before they have symptoms. Um, so, but uh, absolutely, it, it, implies, it implies really good public health. It also implies, again, where I'm imagining a home situation where someone's sick at home, uh, let's, you know, very likely scenario, the three-year-old goes to daycare, comes home, three-year-old's sick, so you want to screen the rest of the family, you want to screen the parents, you want to screen if they're living with elderly, immunocompromised, uh, you know, personnel as well, or nursing homes, like those types of scenarios, I think this would be most effective. Um, but we still have to figure out how we project healthcare to the home. And so the other implicit, in addition to really good public health, is how do you take interventions into the home? So that's why we're going to talk technology. So anyway, um, we're de-risking it. So I think, I think we're finding different patterns before someone is contagious, um, whether that's a blood test, and we can look at their RNA transcripts and look at in, like early innate immune signals like interferon pathways. Um, we're really interested in if wearable technology can accomplish this. Um, and I'm a curmudgeon about wearables, although I'm wearing a Fitbit right now. Um, but, the, but there may be something to this. So this is a really fascinating um, concept that after you're exposed, we sort of, after you're exposed, are, if we can assess if you are, if you will, vulnerable to infection or not, um, that may have something very significant in terms of contagiousness. So first of all, if you have pre-existing immunity at very high levels, you're probably not going to be contagious. So one of the things we should probably figure out is how we can screen for pre-existing immunity at the point of care. But also, like, what if you're incredibly tired, you're stressed out, your cortisol levels are through the roof, or something like that, um, you may be much more likely to get infected, right? And certainly our University of Maryland cohort, or, or, or if you remember your college days, right? You know, after finals, everybody gets sick, right? And so, so this idea of looking at heart rate variability, looking at how well you sleep in that 24 to 48 hour period, looking at uh, those types of physiologic markers, which even a Fitbit can give you, um, maybe that's part of the equation. And what that does is that at least lets you think, okay, well, if, if, we're, if we're tracking continuous, if, we're tracking, if we have continuous wearable technology that can give us a hint if someone is likely to become infected, then that subset is maybe who we target for a blood draw to see what their RNA transcripts are. You see them say, so it's an ensemble of technologies that may be able to get us greater prediction. This, but it's, this program is a great example of DARPA's like kind of crazy, and, and this stuff is really, really hard. I mean, if we are even able to get close to discovering what those markers are, I think we can, I think we transform the field. Um, so uh, so that was a, that's a big program. We have multiple groups. We have lots of groups doing data anal analytics and all that other stuff with it. Um, this project started off as, uh, as, as, a, as a small cost-sharing partnership um, with a group called Global Good, um, a nonprofit that's affiliated with the Gates Foundation. Um, the, uh, but what happened was we, I was out there a few years ago, and we were talking about some of their different capabilities. And we, we both gravitated to a certain topic that I think is completely transformative. So what they said to me is they said, you know, Matt, we do a, a lot of image recognition machine learning, right? Um, they had lots of expertise in this. And then at the time, they were looking at malaria microscopy and saying, OK, can we, instead of having a microscopist, can we use machine learning to find the malaria parasite in the smear? Um, and they were making good progress on that. And they said, you know, I think we can apply this to ultrasound. And I said, you know what would be really interesting is if we could ultrasound the lungs and see if we can get something meaningful from lung ultrasound. And the dogma on lung ultrasound is lungs are full of air, can't really see much. If you can see something, it's very subtle findings. It's a little bit of marker here, a little bit of marker there. It's not anatomic, right? It's not like you're looking at a baby or looking at a heart or something like that. Um, so we said, well, if we could apply machine learning to a lung ultrasound image and say yes or no, you have pneumonia, or mild, moderate, severe, or you have pleural effusion or something like that, um, then we'd be really cooking. Um, well, it turns out, first of all, that portable ultrasound technology is here. 
um, DARPA is not investing in that. So, so part one of show and tell is that this is a G device, um, and this is like three or four years old, right? So, but but again, transducer. Now, really, the technology is at the point where you, you plug the transducer into your cell phone or some other kind of tablet. Um, our our medics. This is becoming kind of a routine tool in the toolbox for our medics to carry. Why? Because you can ultrasound if you're trying to put in a central line, for example. You can ultrasound if you have blood in your abdomen to see if you have internal bleeding after trauma. So it's becoming a useful technology for them to carry. And I mean, look, anybody, you know, it's, it's perfect for DOD. It's lightweight. It's easy to use. Um, the hard part for the medics and for me and for most people is that it requires three to six months of training to be able to be like, okay, well, that line... Okay, I think that's normal. There's maybe a line there, and you know, it just it 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 requires extensive training to be able to read a lung ultrasound, and that training is a perishable skill. And when we're training medics, you have to train them on a thousand different things, right? So um, it, it's just it's a it's a perfect project for a machine learning technology, especially because machine learning, well, machine learning, like, what machines love is like, oh yeah, that's a little bit gray and that's a little bit white. Like that, that very subtle distinction that even our human eye isn't very good at, it's what these things do. As long as you have a, an established database of these are pneumonia, these images are normal, you can go through that training algorithm. So the cool part about this um, is that uh, it's working. <laughs> like we're actually having uh, quite a bit of success. Um, in terms of the algorithm compared to expert reading, being able to accurately identify pneumonia and pleural effusion and air around the lung space called pneumothorax. And the other part for Matt, which I think is really cool, is that the clinical research to obtain those images um, has been uh, done predominantly in the military health system. So we're using places like Brook Army Medical and Center in San Antonio and all this other stuff to collect the images to be part of that. And that way, it incorporates itself very nicely into where we train our medics. And Fort Bragg is another site that we have up and running. So um, the, the, uh, all of that, again, with, fair, with a fairly modest investment, we think is going to be transformative. So our, our intention, um, this is an example of a GE device. Our intention, we've been working closely with Philips, which makes a Lumify very similar to this, um, which is what our medics are currently carrying. So the partnership has been with Global Good, but also with Philips to take this, this algorithm all the way through to FDA approval. So isn't that cool? That, yeah, that, that is really cool. So, so from a public health standpoint, we, we got to pass it. I mean, we got to make this really show and tell us. <laughs> Send that around and kind of mess with it a little bit. Um, we're not going to ultrasound you as part of the <laughs> seminar. We don't have time. Um, but <laughs> but well, so, you know, uh, see if the baby's kicking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I, when I, I present this all the time, but I'm like, well, we, we want now. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, in terms, of the, in, terms, in terms of the machine learning algorithm, does yeah. it have to be uploaded, or is it inherent in the device? I mean, so if you get cut off so, from the internet, right? So happens? right now we're still training. The goal is is that the algorithm runs on the device itself. So essentially, the the CONOPS is like an AED, where you put it in yeah, yeah. twelve places across the chest cavity, and then you go, you know, wait thirty seconds, pneumonia right middle level. Um, so, so why is this cool? So first of all, the, obviously Global Good and Gates Foundation say, okay, for pediatric pneumonia, um, we think this would be transformative. But for pandemic preparedness, I, I, you know, the, the point I make routinely is that you know, with our surveillance systems, we've always really been focused on pathogen identification, right? How many, how many cases of influenza? How many cases, how many current cases of Ebola? The much harder part of the equation is, well, you have influenza, but are you sick or not? And that, are you sick or not, first of all, it's just hard to collect. And for things like influenza, it's very subjective, right? I have aches and pains, I usually don't have a fever. Okay, you do have a fever, well, how do you make sense of that? And what percentage of those patients ever have a chest x-ray? And, oh, by the way, the chest x-ray lags. Ultrasound is actually much more sensitive for things like pleural effusion, too. You get even small amounts can be detected very easily. So um, we don't have a good way to assess severity. But if we pull this off, we have a good way to assess severity. And so one of the things that we're continuing to work through is that, well, let's say we are able to establish this. Let's say we are able to even get FDA approval for this. Um, and I will say one other thing. The idea with FDA approval is that if it's, um, 
if we can get FDA approval for this indication, then you can imagine other indications as well. So our, our medics are very interested in trauma indications. When they do the blood in the abdomen, the FAST exam, can, you, uh, can that be automated? So, and can that be quantified? So we're, we're, we have actually, the FDA's been fantastic um, in terms of a partnership and okay, like how are they gonna review this? And, um, but then this becomes the first of many applications. But the, uh, the other part of this though is that the beauty of ultrasound is I can ultrasound you 10 times a day if I want to. So not only is it a, okay, you have pneumonia, yes or no, or you have pleural fluid, it's something useful in resuscitation. So I'm giving you too much fluid, maybe I should back off, right? Because yeah. your lungs are starting to fill up. Mm -hmm. And imagine that technology in, a, in an Ebola treatment unit mm -hmm. where, uh, again, you can just put the probe on. You don't have, you know, minimal training. You put the probe on. We're seeing pulmonary edema. We didn't see it two hours ago. <laughs> Got back on the fluid, you know? So, so again, we think it's enabling technology. But also, again, if we can figure out how to feed this into public health surveillance systems and... That, that we got to figure out how to do that. It's, 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 not, it's not necessarily obvious. I always think, though, that between diagnostic tests and if you had this ultrasound kind of automatically reporting, then you're reporting a flu case with a mild to moderate pleural effusion. So, um, okay, let me tell you about a couple other things, and then we, let's have more dialogue. So, um, so this, this is our portable diagnostics platform uh, called the RAMP. Um, we were... Um, with, without going into a lot of details, we've been investing in this technology for a, a while, and um, we hit a hiccup uh, from, I'll just say from a logistics standpoint, it wasn't, it wasn't a technical challenge, it was a, um, uh, how, how, to, how to get the prototype and how to scale this. But the, the vision here, and, and what we're seeing now is that there's other technologies, we're making a lot of great progress in the area of accurate, portable, point of care diagnostics. Um, we think this, which is still in the prototype stage, and this, this one is not a working prototype, it's just, it gives you a, a demonstration in terms of form factor. But the concept here is that you essentially take a sample, you put the sample on the card, you put your card in the box, you can do it this way, you close the lid, you press one button, and then within 45 minutes you have your answer. Um, this, it, it's, a, it's, sort of, it's taking microfluidics and PCR technology and it reads across on an array platform here, but um, the goal, like if this is successful, it's three things. Um, as accurate as any PCR that you would run in a CDC reference lab. It's multiplexed that because it reads across an array and we can multiplex, it, it gives you, it, our goal is about between 8 and 12 of the relevant pathogens for an infectious diseases syndrome. So for example, febrile illness in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, screening for, and again, it's our choice, but you know, dengue, chick malaria, um, but also Ebola, CCHF, and, and you can sort of see the relevance for the current outbreak. So uh, as accurate as lab-based testing, multiplexed, and then the goal, again, anybody can use it. So not, everybody says, oh, that's clear wave. Yes, but we don't want CLIA waved. <laughs> we want uh, a medic can use it because you either swab the nose or you get a finger stick, card, card in the box, press one button. What we maintain is that if you have to do three or four steps to prep the card and then put it in the box, like even those in a, in a very remote field setting um, add too much complexity. If you've got three droppers and two reagents and all that, you know, once even one additional step, you know, can really mess it up. So you see again, this is, these are technologies for the medic, um, but have a lot of global health applications too. And just the, the final point I'll make, and we'll keep moving, you can pass this one around just so you get an idea on the form factor and how much it weighs. Um, <laughs> it's got a big battery in there. How expensive is it? Um, so the goal is that this thing costs, cost of goods in the neighborhood of two to 5,000. Um, right now, in prototype phase, it's more expensive than that. The cards, we'd love to get to about 5 to $10 per test. Um, so It's a lot lighter than a Connex box, which is what the diagnostic <laughs> That's is. That's right. It's a lot lighter than an area right? medical lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, question? Yeah, in terms of viral load or bacterial load for a nose swab or for blood, yep. have you looked at, has the technology gotten to the point where you can say, okay, here's our 
limited detection in terms of for nasal swabbing, thinking about yeah. some of the respiratory? Yeah, 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 no, no, you're right. The, the goal is to have the limit of detection that would be comparable to a laboratory-based PCR. Okay. So if, we, uh, if you run a chiagen kit for extraction and then you run a PCR, so if that's, you know, um, and, and again, for infections like influenza and RSV, so we have a respiratory panel, uh, influenza, RSV, but the idea is to add things like MERS coronavirus or the novel flu or something like that when the outbreak occurs. Um, but those, you know, there's plenty of virus in the nose, so, we're, so those, are, those are fairly easy targets to hit. The harder ones is, first of all, extracting from blood, mm -hmm. because blood's a very complex matrix. Um, but extracting for, from blood in low pathogen load. So Ebola, less of a problem because you have so much pathogen, or, or dengue viremia, high pathogen load. Um, for bacterial pathogens, like if you're in the ICU and there's only like one or two CFUs per mil, harder. That's a lot harder. And so we're not, the, we're, we're, we're less, we're not gonna use this as a sepsis panel necessarily. Um, we're gonna use this for like acute febrile illness, acute febrile illness in Africa and really aim at those bacteria, I'm sorry, viral pathogens that are the most common causes. Um, Biopath, leptospirosis is another one. You know what I mean? Not a virus, but, um, but the com malaria is not a virus either. But those things that are pathogens in the blood that um, have fairly reasonable levels that we can hit their LOD. Okay? Um, so, but the other thing, just real quick, is that because this multiplex and reads across an array platform, we've all, again, we always focus on pathogen response, but we can also use this for uh, your own immune response. And it goes back to the original point I was making on the Prometheus program which is if we can find messenger RNA transcripts, the very first step of the process when you're responding to infection for things like interferon pathways, that we can actually take a drop of blood and read this on the array because I can read you know, 20 or 30 or 50 targets on that array. So I can find that ensemble of interferon pathways and a few other innate immune responses that allow me to predict if someone is gonna be contagious. And this, I think, you know, again, imagine like an Uber Health type of scenario where we bring healthcare to the patient, where you bring that and you bring the ultrasound and you bring. This is also a this this is a small business um, technology, which essentially is a blood draw where you put this on your arm, press the button. Um, about a minute later, you get about 150 microliters of blood. So, um, the point is. Lots of portable technologies that we can, again, at Steady State in Washington, D.C., we can bring to the home. And reusable? Uh, no, not reusable. But, <laughs> but these things are like, you, you, can, you can scale this and make this very cheaply. So you just take a bunch of those out there. But we would, uh, this is a really good example of, um, I think this would be very useful for things like Ebola outbreak and things like that where you don't want to do a nor you know, blood draw and all this other stuff and have needles. I mean, this is a needleless system. Um, so they're actually, this is an investment now that they're partnering in the Department of Defense with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and working on, okay, how can we use this for Ebola? Um, but my point is, you bring all the stuff to the patient you can do that in a resource limited settings or you can do that in Washington DC and we you know you take care of the patient you take care of the family you take care of the household you bring the health care to them um, so let me uh, we should do more question and answer but I, I wanted very quickly I'm going to do two other technologies because they're they're great for show and tell um, so uh, we talked about Fitbit and I made the case uh, heart rate variability during sleep maybe, or heart rate variability, or some things that we can, we can understand. For certain, but if we, I think if we truly want to understand physiology, um, we are going to have to get under the skin. So a lot of people say, well, e everything in the future will be non-invasive. I'm not sure that's true. I think at least for a subset of patients for certain analytes, we're going to have to get into the subcutaneous tissue. So we've made an investment. This is a company we invested in uh, very early, we're, this, it, this is the classic DARPA story. No one else would, no one else would fund them. It's two people. They're out in San Francisco. Um, one was a diagnostics person. One was a pro was a chemist. And what they said was, the the fundamental point of if we're going to put something underneath the skin for sensing, the problem has always been we try to put metal underneath the skin. You form a scar around it. It doesn't sense anymore. It can't transmit, and you can't you know has no more contact with the analyte in the subcutaneous tissue. So they said can we use a hydrogel and coat it with the enzymes that will allow us to sense the analyte of choice, near infrared signal out to the skin to a reader, um, but it's not recognized as a foreign body, so it incorporates itself into the capillary bed, 
Um, so this is the scar. And normally, this, in this case, it's a tissue integrating sensor. So it can stay in the tissue for days to months to years and still sense the analyte of choice and transmit that through. So, the, uh, so they're small. We can pass, pass some of these around. Yeah, pass this one around um, to give you a size of this. This is also on the... So the blue thing in here. It's the little tiny blue thing. You can also see it in sort of how you inject it underneath the skin. Imagine that's your subcutaneous tissue. So the current reader is something like this, which you would wear here or you would wear on the leg or wherever. Um, we're DARPA, right? And so everybody else in the building is really good at microelectronics, so we want it to be this. So if you, you want to pass that one around too. Um, so imagine you sort of wear your Band-Aid, you have your analyte underneath the skin. Now, um, the, uh, the point I'll make is that um, this was a, the, the, the investment started uh, the investment started uh, by another program manager. By, by another program manager, and then when they left, they said, "Okay, well, we want you to pick up this program." And I said, "Continuous sensing. I'm a curmudgeon. Everybody says they can sense everything and all this other stuff. You know, it, you, you, there's lot the laboratory, but like tons of labs all over America and the world are saying, oh, I can sense these analytes, and I can make the new. You know, I'm the new materials person who can make these things that go underneath the skin and they do fine." So I was skeptical. Um, and so then they came and presented to me, and they said, oh, by the way, let's show us our, we'll show you our human data now, because we did our first in human studies at that time. It was approximately two and a half years. Um, and they're like, oh, and here's the oxygen tracing, which the person is currently sensing on the screen. So three, and now they're up to three years from the initial kind of putting this underneath the skin that it's still continuously sensing oxygen at the tissue level. So I, I just find that remarkable. <laughs> I think that's remarkable and that's transformative that they've kind of cracked the code on doing this. Um, the company is interested. We've been very interested. We're both interested in oxygen sensing. Um, this, the product is now CMARC approved in Europe. We're working through our process of FDA approval. We're doing clinical studies, again, in, in our um, military health system over right across the way here at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research on exercise physiology and things like that. It's, it's different than if you're wearing a pulse ox, Usually that stays pretty constant unless things are really, really bad. Um, but this has a lot of variability during exercise, depending on what exercise you're doing and what muscle group and when you recover. So in terms of uh, one obvious application is exercise physiology, but also vulnerable patient populations that are susceptible to influenza and then they get sick, like COPD patients or congestive heart failure. Um, we think there's going to be a lot of applications for that. Um, the company really sees a lot of applications for continuous glucose sensing. Um, so now you don't need finger six four times a day. We're not investing in that because the commercial sector is now heavily investing in this company for the continuous glucose sensor. It shows, though, that's great for us, right? Because now they're helping with scaling and prototyping and de-risking the technology and taking it in front of the FDA. So those are all good. What I really like is lactate. If we had continuous tissue level lactate sensing, lactate goes up early in infection, lactate goes up when you're uh, dehydrated during trauma, um, if for, you know, for severe illness and uh, resuscitation scenarios, and having that continuous tracking of lactate, uh, we think would be transformative for how we take care of, of severely ill patients and, and infected patients. So, um, so that's also really cool. What's that? The last one for all the kidney failure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. No, that's there, there's a lot of there's a lot of medical applications too. And and our our, our trick is that we want to the commercial applications are great. What we don't want to do is we don't want the DARPA investment then to go to an exclusively commercial application. You know. So if we uh, if we transform how we care for diabetes, like. That's great. <laughs> like that is truly, yeah. really, you know. I, I will be. We will. We will all go home and be very proud that we did that. Um, but but our mission is national security. Our mission is pandemic preparedness, and so we need to make sure that the technology translates for that. And hence why we're pushing so hard to get the lactate sensor up and running. Um, so all this has been about like sensing the problem, right? We we, we have big investments in intervention, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. Um, I'm going to make a couple really quick points. Um, DARPA, with a previous program manager, had done quite a bit of investment in RNA and DNA technology originally in the vaccine space. The fundamental premise here is that if we need to rapidly scale a medical countermeasure quickly, such as a vaccine, that making a lot of DNA in a short period of time is more feasible than other vaccine 
production methods. We've had DNA vaccines for 20 plus years, lots of products in, in clinical trials. They tend to be safe. Um, we don't have any approved products, and so the, the, you know, they have to work too. And so there's been challenges with DNA technology. The next generation of this is RNA. So you're seeing a lot of companies now working on RNA vaccines, which seem to offer similar aspects of safety, but also that they may be more effective. That, there's, no RNA, there's no FDA approved RNA vaccines yet, but we'll see. But, but again, the concept is you can make a lot of RNA in a manufacturing process in a short period of time. So it offers you that opportunity to scale if you can get it right. So we did a previous investment um, pretty significantly in the vaccine space. We're still working and de-risking that technology by taking uh, at least a couple of those products through phase one clinical trials. Um, but w during that program, kind of halfway through, they pivoted to an additional concept, and that was to complement a vaccine strategy. Um, why don't we... Uh, to complement a vaccine strategy where you may require two shots uh, before you really are protected against that pathogen. So let's say, you know, four to eight, you know, six to eight weeks um, for a two-dose shot series. T to complement that, what if we could give you near-immediate protection? So 72 hours after administration. And the way to do that would be to um, discover, identify a highly potent antibody, and then make sure that antibody's in your system so you are protected, right? Um, the problem is, is that once we discover a highly potent antibody, that process um, takes a long time. You have to brew it up in bioreactors, all this other stuff. Our experience, can we, you know, like we use VRC114 as an example, but with others, I mean, I always quote an 18 to 24 month process from the time that you say, this antibody, we think this antibody works, to having sufficient doses, you know, 100 doses or hundreds of doses that would be responsive. Now, that protein based antibody that we call, we call it protein-based antibodies. Those may be the best way for treatment. So think ZMAP or, you know, again, BRC114. Um, but for uh, prophylaxis, where you can probably get away with lower concentration of the antibody, the principle is that, well, why don't we, once we know that antibody sequence, why don't we put it on a DNA or an RNA, give you your shot of DNA or RNA, and have your muscle cell, instead of the bioreactor, make that protective level of antibody in, 20, in 72 hours. Because remember, going back to this idea of can we make thousands of doses in a short period of time in nucleic acid? Well, it's not a given, but th that is at least technologically feasible. Everybody kind of tracking that? So what we, the, the previous investment in DARPA was foundational. It was, can we give you a shot of DNA, give that to a mouse, can we save the mouse from Ebola or influenza or chikungunya or other infections? Uh, we are able to do that. We de-risked the technology sufficiently, so we said, okay, now de-risked, um, the DARPA leadership, and this is, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm being somewhat accurate here, <laughs> the DARPA leadership said, that's great, but if we're truly going to take pandemics off the table, Matt, what do you need to go start to finish? And I said, well, we're going to need a four-year program, we're going to need substantial investment, but we're going to need to be able to do five things as part of an integrated team, start to finish, to get to the point where we could have 20,000 doses of a medical countermeasure that gives you near immediate protection within 60 days, okay? Um, so yes, absolutely impossible by today's standards, <laughs> um, but this is a space that no one else will do this. Um, but the other part is that no one else really puts together this start to finish platform. So in other words, a pharmaceutical company can make an RNA product that encodes for an antibody but they may not be able to actually, you know, obtain the virus so that they can have antigens ready to do their antibody discovery. So what we said was, so we're funding four teams. Um, I'm happy to go into details on this, but essentially um, to do each of these five steps so that we'd have 20,000 doses ready in 60 days. This, we're in the first year of a four-year investment. The good news has been this, the area of this find the antibody and evolve the antibody, sort of this portion. Um, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how the, the amount of automation that now can occur so that we can find an antibody in a ridiculously short period of time. So this part, being able to do this part in three to four weeks, taking B cells from a recovered patient, sorting them, looking at all the different antibody possibilities, you know, finding 10,000 antibodies against influenza, screening those down to 10 or 15 that are protective, putting those on a DNA or RNA and doing the animal model testing to see if they protect the animal. Like, all of that's going to be feasible. 
Now, the hard part, the hardest part of all of this is actually in this space. First of all, the manufacturing. Second of all, the regulatory stuff. So we have heavy engagement with the FDA. But the third part is, is that if I inject DNA in your arm, I really need sufficient quantities of antibody to protect you. And so those muscle cells really have to kick out antibodies in a short period of time. We have to, we've been able to show that in animal models. We have to prove that in phase one clinical trials. And so that's the intention in 2019 and 20. So if that's hard, how do you add a zero to that 20,000 doses or two zeros? Um, we could do that. Uh, the, the, the hard part with doing, first of all, so we have to de-risk this, <laughs> so doing any of this. The, the, the principle of 20,000 doses is that it's a fire break, right? So, so this product is intended for sort of the ring vaccination type scenarios. And so, um, uh, the, and again, people are like, this is to replace vaccine. It doesn't replace vaccine. You're still going to vaccinate, but this buys you time and creates a fire break. But to get to that type of scaling is actually achievable. First of all, we have to show this works, okay? The second part is investing in the manufacturing capability where you can go from 20,000 to 2 million. But, but it's not, but once you're starting to make it, like, in other words, if you have three, you have three bioreactors in the manufacturing facility, like, once you're starting to get successful, you just have 10, right? So it's much harder than that, <laughs> but, um, but, but yes. But if nucleic acid can truly be de-risked, that's the opportunity. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I mean, it is a fire break, but there, there's some theoretical risk that you'll blunt vaccine response, right? I mean, if you, if you do this. It's a good question. Yeah. So what if, if you had a shot of the, the DNA that encodes for the antibody in one arm and the vaccine in the other arm? Um, does that help or hurt or compete or not? We've done some animal work that shows sort of that you can give both and that they don't compete. Um, but that would also have, you, we, we have to de-risk that aspect of it too. Are you looking at, um, just thinking about kind of, I, I tend to prefer viruses, so just thinking about <laughs> viral evolution and potentially pandemic strains that we don't know exactly the antibody that's gonna be, or the antigen that's gonna be the, sure. the key. Would you, with this technology, look at then mapping, like, here are potential um, antigens of attack to develop a monoclonal or yeah. a polyclonal antibody to um, treat? So thinking yeah. about, like, an H7 or an H5 or an H9. Yeah, it's an outstanding question. Target. It's a really, really, really good question. This, I'm, I'm, I'm just de-risking 60 days and 20,000 doses with this investment. Okay. This uh, capability really does afford that opportunity for you to say, we think that we're starting to see some novel influenza virus evolving towards this. If it makes two more mutations, it's gonna look like this. It's hemagglutinin and it's probably gonna be structured this way. So let's have a monoclonal ready. Um, and then we can say, sure, because uh, if we get this nucleic acid process right, we can say, look, I can make you I'll make you a thousand doses and we can just make sure it works in animal models so that we're ready and we can, you know, flip the switch and scale it if this does become bad. Instead of saying, oh, there's an H7, okay, stockpile, you know, right, pull the right. trigger, hundred million dollar investment, and then it doesn't really pan out. This you could do in a fairly short period of time much more affordably, but this idea of anticipating viral evolution and being ready with a countermeasure, that, that's, if you can figure out what that, you, you have to figure out that viral part of it. But when that is figured out, that connects very nicely. What else? A couple more questions. We're almost at 9 o'clock. Yeah, we get kicked out of the room uh -oh. at some point. But, um, Four more minutes. Yeah. Two more. A few more. A couple more questions. I've got lots of questions. I, don't know. <laughs> I know, but we've got to have the team. What do you guys think? I'm going to start calling on you guys. Question. Sure. Um, so I went to a technology conference in San Francisco last year. And are you looking at any of that technology looking at like bioengineering bacteria to create vaccines that are, you know, sure. thermostable and cutting costs sure. on like protein processing as well? Yeah. So like when that. when you talk about when you talk about synthetic biology, I mean, first of all, I don't know what that means everywhere. exactly. I mean, the, this this idea. Yeah. Um, 
is essentially synthetic biology, right? You're taking DNA, you're going to find a sequence. Um, uh, every aspect of this whole process, though, is, if you will, the genetic revolution um, has come part of it. Now, we're not, we're not doing sort of crazy cutting edge stuff on that because we kind of don't need to. Um, because what, what we're doing is more kind of, again, de-risking that you can take DNA or RNA. You have to figure out how to package it. You have to do a lot of, you have to engineer the sequence, but you also have to engineer how that's delivered. Getting across the, the cell membrane is the hardest part. Um, but, so we're doing quite a bit of investment there. There's also, with, the, with, the, with genetic engineering, though, the point that I've been making about this ability to find antibodies in an incredibly short period of time, all that's inspired by it, too, the fact that we can take a bunch of B cells, separate them, figure out which ones are making the antibody of choice, and then you, you know, take those few thousand, sequence them, understand the, you know, understand the, the structure that's going to come from those sequence. So, um, so we're, we're leveraging that technology. Other groups in, a, in, in, our, in our office are sort of pushing the next generation of, of genetic engineering um, for those types of purposes. So you take your pill and the exactly. bacteria. There's, like, there's this one company who was showcasing their thing. And right. They, like you take your fill and that bacteria, and you know, like, creates like an IgA response in the gut and all that other stuff. And like so, heat as well, you yeah. Know, cold chains, so, you know, there's a lot of like crazy, crazy challenges yeah. out there coming out. So. Yeah, I, I would say that our office has been um, on the cutting edge of a lot of this. This is a bit more of uh, taking a lot of that now and applying it into a start to finish platform. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, we'll go there, there, and then Matt gets one more. Sorry. Do you, are there any not concerns, but um, considerations about some of the technology actually encouraging evolution of these pathogens to either evade detection, treatment, sure. vaccines, and... So again, not as part of this program, okay. um, but, uh, but again, I mean, you're, you're seeing this throughout. The, we're, we're understanding we can, we can passively observe how viruses evolve, but, I mean, you see this, you know. Every virology group in <laughs> every university virology team in America can say, okay, but if we make these changes, we can make this virus and we can see the trajectory that it goes. So there is, yeah, there's always, there's always concern about that. I mean, that's the whole gain of function dual use um, debate. Um, this program sort of steers clear of all that and sort of says whatever Mother Nature figures out or if someone intentionally engineers a pathogen to go a certain way, um, basically all I need to know is that sequence. And once I know that sequence, I can start this process super fast. And you see, so, so I, I usually focus on pandemic preparedness. I use Ebola examples. My contention of every th technology that you've heard about today um, has a, can address either the naturally occurring or the engineered threat. Allow me to take you back to Prometheus. If yeah, you don't mind. Um, sure. So, you know, I guess the idea is to identify biomarkers and predict, you know, spread patterns and yep. so forth. And it uh, looks like you're testing a little bit of that at the University of Maryland. So, my thinking is, yeah. my question then is, is there a plan to sort of test this with different pathogens, or do you hope that what you learn from testing with a particular pathogen yeah. can inform? Based on, you know, historical yeah. knowledge of how you guys are asking right. excellent questions today. <laughs> that is an outstanding, outstanding question. You're asking, these are the questions that I'm like, that keep me up at night. Like, I'm like, what if, or what if not? Um, uh, the Prometheus program is focused on acute respiratory, specifically viral infections, specifically influenza. We are looking, like, influenza is our primary target here. When we uh, observe respiratory infections in the community, we can multiplex that. So we can say influenza and RSV and paraflu and coronavirus. So, so we're getting an understanding of that. We're seeing secondary transmission, right? So someone has RSV and then two days later, someone else has RSV. Um, tons of people have rhinovirus in their nose. We don't know what it means. Like it, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's not, and it's transferred person to person. So that's all very complex. Your question is incredibly insightful. Are the can we find predictive markers for influenza that are also true for RSV, <laughs> that are also true for MERS coronavirus, right? Even just in the acute respiratory viral infection category, I'm hoping that there are common markers. But there may be. In other words, I sort of you know, alluded to this idea of, well, maybe if you sleep really poorly those two nights, you're susceptible. Well, you're probably susceptible to flu or RSV or anything else or maybe chicken gunya or something, you know, depending on if the mosquito bites you and you, you fight it off or not. Um, 
Uh, but also from the RNA transcripts and that immune response, I think there's going to be some things that are very unique to influenza, and I think there's going to be some things that are general. But what I hope is that the concept can be applied to all pathogens, because the Prometheus concept for an Ebola outbreak, I mean, you can imagine how useful that would be. Again, different pathogen, different incubation periods, lots of different complexity. But um, I hope that some of what we find in Prometheus becomes generalizable. Right. So there's hope that this is going to be flexible. At least in terms of methodology. Okay. At least if we can understand, if we can say, okay, RNA transcripts, they may be different for Ebola than influenza. Um, wearable technology, you know, all of those things, you know, at least that methodology of those, of sensing a bunch of different things and coming up with an algorithm to predict. I think that will be generalizable. But the specific markers is a, is a hypothesis that I think everybody's really interested in. It's a great question. All right, Matt, one more. No, I'm good. Uh, and, uh, I've, I've spoken up. But it's a great presentation. Thank you oh, very much. It's really thank good you. stuff. Yeah. Well, good. Y your funding's not getting cut or anything, right? It's, <laughs> <laughs> this is still moving forward. So, so, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, but it's, it's public knowledge, sort of DARPA's annual budget, I think. And so DARPA's annual budget is at the very least stable. I mean, in the Department of Defense, again, uh, it's, it's, you know, budgets, budgets kind of can come and go. But um, I think, I, I mean, I think that the good news, and it really goes back to the first point I made, I think it's a big deal. Some things that are really, really cool. DARPA as an organization has said pandemic preparedness is so important to us that they allow us to invest in this, and that it's, I mean, it's one of the top priorities. It's one of the things that's featured as, as part of DARPA. And DARPA has tons of competing priorities for national security. So it, it's really good this has been prioritized. The second thing, and I don't want this point to be lost, I mean, the NIH and the BARDA collaborations around all of this, this, um, we have great collaborations with BARDA, this is one of the metamine projects that I alluded to. Um, we're utilizing, where BART has really helped us, is that they, we have BARTA manufacturing experts that have now become our consultants for all of our performers, including we're setting up site visits for them. I mean, so, so the, I, I'm leveraging that. The, that type of DODHHS collaboration is what, of course, we need a lot more of. Um, but like, <laughs> this, I'm, I'm really excited that we're actually doing it. Okay. One last question. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Perfusa is the name of that company. Yeah. yeah. So. How would you use that, them uh, in the military context? Do you, would you? Is it like during a pandemic? You would put it in, into your yeah. military, or I, I struggle seeing the how it works. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, again. <laughs> outstanding questions. So, yeah. How does how does it actually how does it actually get used? Yeah. I think there's two different scenarios. One is if the sensor can work for months to years. So you have an oxygen sensor, you have a lactate sensor, you have, you have that sensor in your arm. You don't have to measure it all the time, but you measure it. We want the oxygen and lactate sensors to be used for you know, physical fitness training and all that other stuff to sort of optimize. I always say, you know, these are, um, our military personnel should be high performance athletes, yeah. right? Because they're, the, the, what the physical strain that they're undergoing, and we should train them accordingly. Um, this becomes a training tool, right? So to improve. A world where like all of the special forces have that essentially. Sure, sure. Or the out, Navy as well. It's not just the special forces. It's not just the special forces. All of us, even the Army yeah. people that work yeah. at a desk, you know, yeah. we need to train too. So it's, it's not just them. That's, right. That's right. That's right. We, I, I joke about it all the time. I have to take a, we, we actually have a, one of the PhDs on my team is a triathlete. And so it's like, okay, so that's the high performance athlete yeah. example. I'm the low performance athlete example. But both both groups need this, so, um, but, but the idea is, is that steady state it can be useful for things like exercise physiology and training so, so that you can imagine that this is something that they're tracking at steady state, but then when they get injured, their lactate level, which is normal, goes through the roof. Um, it gives us an opportunity to do fluid resuscitation and manage that in real time. When you, when you put one of these underneath your skin, it doesn't start working perfectly right away. It takes a little while. How long is a little while? Maybe a couple hours um, to really incorporate and to get the signal so that it's steady. Um, but we also do imagine this in, acute, in an acute situation. So for example, 
uh, someone starts to get very sick. Spikes of fever, their blood pressure is dropping. Uh, in the United States, they're presenting in an ER. In Sub-Saharan Africa, <laughs> you know, it's whatever's in your backpack. Um, but you want to sense if you can monitor them throughout their, their, if you will, their hospital course or their healthcare course. We think that'd be extremely compelling um, to understand what their lactate does. So, for example, trauma injury, we're going to want to follow their lactate for maybe weeks to months. Um, understanding where they are in acute and then where it steadies out. Oh, lactate's normal weight. It went, it went it spiked up again, probably because of secondary infection. I mean, the, I the, potential, the potential here for revolutionary, for, for changes in, in the care of, going beyond the military, changes in the care of just ordinary patients. I mean, this would be the biggest change probably in, in hundred years. I mean, I don't know if anyone's ever been in a hospital, but you know how they wake you up at three o'clock in the morning so they draw your blood and so forth. I mean, the thing is, you and I, and I don't know if there's any other MDs here, we all went through all that horrible training, right, learning how to interpret these lab tests because they know that drawing a tube of blood at three o'clock in the morning from your, from your vein here May or may not correlate with any kind of yeah. actual disease state. So, like, <laughs> yeah, 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 so, so, yeah. so, so we don't so, have to so do that. Yeah. Treating hyponatremia and hypernatremia and, and figuring exactly. out the calculus of the sodium and all that sort of thing. With this, you yeah. could just look it up. You could just, deep, yeah. you know, and you could monitor in real time. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes the guesswork out of yeah. it. We could, we could find, we could find out all sorts of things about clinical physiology. That's and we right. discover that we're doing it all wrong. That's right. You know. Yeah, because we probably, there's, there's a lot, that, <laughs> there's a lot that are big. Well, there's we, a lot of by guess and by God we, in clinical medicine. We create know? dogma based on limited, yeah. limited information I and just totally agree. It's better if you're, you know, on, on army base in Sub-Saharan Africa and you're sick, you don't need to like draw blood exactly. every hour or something. No, that's the it's idea. That's, yeah, no, the, no, that's the idea. That's the idea. All of this, we still have to de-risk our technology. Like, I don't, like, as much as I'd like to say, you're going to see it tomorrow. But, oh. uh, but I'm not, but it's, it's also not science fiction at this point yeah. either, you know, and, and that's why I hope. Uh, one thing I've found is that it's one thing to de-risk the technology. The scaling, scaling technology is really, really difficult. And, you know, we've been talking to, to elevate it strategically a little bit, um, especially on the, on the vaccine and antibody side, groups like CEPI, coming in as a nonprofit, certainly Gates Foundation, the other groups, the, the nonprofits and, and also private sector partnerships have been very helpful there. Um, on the diagnostics and monitoring side of things, it is it's very hard to scale because I think just because there's not the huge commercial attraction. But, but, but Does there, that make sense? But, but, there, but there must. I'm sort of thinking about, again, getting back, getting back to this. Um, uh, yeah, or the, the uh, perfusible. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the just okay, the sensor. I mean, think about the implications for telemedicine. If yeah. you know a single endocrinologist in in, in the, like, the state of Wyoming could monitor every diabetic in real time, but all they have to do is is put their sensor in the comfort of their living room under the UV light or whatever. Yeah. And in and, and in yeah. Know, or Laramie, yeah. Oh, yeah, the yeah, endocrinologist yeah, yeah. can see. <laughs> I can see your. I can see your glucose going up and down. Exactly. Like nine times a day. Exactly, exactly, and that was pro that will probably be a more accurate representation of your glucose, maybe than A1C. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you have targeted personalized medicine. Yeah, yeah. Maybe even oh, couple cool. it with your urine patterns and yeah. the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's precisely it. Yeah. That's precisely it. Yeah. So, so yes, Did I, I take two extra. And days? I agree with you. Yeah. And and they do have private sector. You know, this is small biotech. I, they've gotten they've gotten significant yeah. investment yeah. with the you know with the ultrasound program, for example. Philips that recognizes too. that yeah. this will be very useful. So they've we're not funding Philips to do a lot of the regular work Phillips has really stepped up so so there is there is there are those private sector kind of matching opportunities I still think I'm, I'm still struggling though we, we want a lot of this to scale to millions <laughs> you know so we're at the we're in the tens to hundreds now and I'd like to see it get to millions sooner I have one question if I could I know that from a DARPA perspective it is de-risking the technology and making it available for mm -hmm. potential uses um, Coming from thinking purely public health perspective, we have a hard time getting people to even vaccinate their kids against measles. Yeah. I think everyone in this room would get the sensor in a heartbeat yep. if we have the choice. Um, oh, I I'm going there too. I'm like the conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> really I'm not putting that in my arm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I would do it in a heartbeat. But I think how do you, and I realize this might not be within DARPA's realm, but thinking about how do you not only de risk the technology, but how do you do 
risk communication to say this is actually going to save you money, your health, your well-being, because we can't even get people to vaccinate their children on for flu, for measles, et cetera. So yeah. um, thinking from a, even just domestic perspective of looking at uh, improving quality of life, public health interventions, mm -hmm. are there conversations either at the DARPA level or uh, beyond to think about how technologies like this can be yeah. scaled up and then actually yeah. used? So you're absolutely right. Uh, we worry about, yes, we worry about it for this. We worry about it a lot for this, right? If you, I mean, this is a shot in the arm. Right. Um, uh, so so we, we will encounter a very similar uh, situation uh, once this is at the point of scaling. Created um, by the military. We'll red team those for you. We'll come up with every crazy <laughs> thing we can possibly that's right. say. To and and it's, uh, again, <laughs> it's sort of... We're going to roll on our yeah. students. Like, Perfect. Perfect. Just take this. <laughs> and, yet, though, and yet, though, I, I continually ask people, like, because I, I do these complete unscientific polls of colleagues and so forth, is, does it bother you that Amazon knows everything you purchase and oh, exactly what yeah, kind of literature yeah, you and exactly... And a surprising yeah. number of people is, are totally good with it. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't mind right. that, that right. Walmart and Amazon know exactly my buy patterns and exactly where I'm shopping, right. you know, and I, I tend to log on at 11.30 at night precisely. Right. But we won't share any information yeah, yeah. with public health. Like, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we don't trust public yeah. health, but we trust <laughs> Amazon. But I think the, with you. the answer to your question is we worry about it. We don't, we, we, we don't invest in that space. Um, again, in, we're, at our best, we are partners in the federal government with universities, okay. academics. I think that is in the purview. I think that's what you've talked about is squarely in the purview of public health, um, with the CDC, with state and local public health. But they, the hope is, is that they figure out how do we leverage the latest understanding of psychology and anthropology and social sciences to accomplish that mission, you know? And so, I, but I guess I'll conclude on this. The fun part about the DARPA model is that, you know, we, we're flexible, we take risks, we question dogma, <laughs> you know, we say it's not established this way. I'd love to see public health do that type of investment when we talk about public health research, right? And we've talked with your group before about leveraging data analytics with, uh, you know, the, the, the best, if you will, in machine learning and AI, you know, that you can get from the academic community. Um, I think in the social sciences, too, I think that's an underutilized resource. I think, you know, you can imagine that if you, you know, funded why, why do people, why won't people get vaccinated? And if you really funded cutting edge research in terms of understanding that problem and then what interventions are most likely to be persuasive for the public good. Um, and in, instead of just academic papers, you know, like everybody has their own opinion, every academic kind of writes their own paper. I mean, you can see sort of a DARPA type model for that type of investment to solve the problem.